Yeah, so I'm part of this uh, organization at Twitter. Uh, we call ourselves Twitter Engineering Effectiveness. Basically, we support the hundreds of developers who are at Twitter and the developer tools that they use. And uh, I'm fairly new to Twitter and very new to Scala, very, very new to typeful and functional programming. So uh, I learned programming in the early 80s with Fortran. That was my high level programming language. Before that, it was assembly. Um, and I was using punch cards on IBM 360. So um, when I was listening to Kathy earlier today, I was wishing I was in one of her CS classes. Really wants me to make go back to school. So, um, so today, the whole point of this talk is if a person like me can start to learn Scala and be really excited about it and uh, work with tools and advanced tools, uh, anybody can do it. So that's the point of the talk. <laughs> um, probably, how many of you are already familiar with ScalaFix? I know a couple of you are. Yeah, so uh, it's uh, basically uh, an open source uh, tool. Uh, came out of the Scala Center, or at least Olaf from the Scala Center and Eugene uh, worked on it. And it's based on the Scala Meta technology, uh, which is used to generate what is known as semantic DBs. It was referred to earlier uh, in one of the talks yesterday. Uh, but basically, it is um, a repo of information, semantic information, that is uh, used by the tool. And it's used for uh, primarily rewriting and linting purposes. Uh, but going forward, uh, we can imagine several use cases and you know, usage models that it can accommodate and incorporate. So it has the notion of uh, user-specified rules for rewriting uh, or linting. And um, there are already some built-in rules uh, within ScalaFix. And it also has the hooks for developing your own custom rules. And everything is done in Scala. So there's only one programming language that you need to know. So, um, And you could do rewrites that are just purely syntactic, in which case you don't need to have a semantic DB. Um, and only if you have to do uh, some deeper or more meaningful uh, or semantic information-based rewrites that we have to depend on the semantic DB information. So at Twitter, as you heard from Dorothy earlier today, we have a monorepo with you know hundreds of thousands of Scala files. Um, we use Pants as the uh, build tool and build system. Um, and uh, about maybe a couple of quarters ago, we started generating semantic DB information for the entire monorepo. And that's not a trivial task. Um, and uh, we also have uh, explored or experimented with ScalaFix and written a few custom rules uh, for our um, Twitter-specific rewrites. And we've also come further ahead in terms of providing an infrastructure for users, Twitter developers, to write custom rules and uh, test them to see if they work. So. so taking a step back uh, from most people's experience, code rewrites are kind of inevitable. I mean, you want to do them for various purposes. Um, uh, stagnant code is basically dead code. Um, and you, here are a few like reasons that you may uh, you may have for rewriting. For example, if you are going from one language version to another, uh, or a compiler version to another, as in the case of Scala. Um, 
And as with Twitter, we, you know, we've had this code around for multiple years and we develop a lot of uh, uh, craft and um, what we call tech debt and um, their APIs that evolve and they get dep deprecated. And um, so you want to get rid of, clean up, you know, clean house every now, every now and then. And then some of the rewrites are forced by external factors like um, frameworks or APIs migration um, and even simple things like we want to get rid of our, um, you know, zillions of warnings, uh, that uh, compiler warnings, and we want to keep our uh, code, uh, the build output kind of clean, logging and clean. So, so um, how many of you are Dilbert fans or even heard of Dilbert? I don't know. <laughs> so, okay. so here's Dilbert uh, talking to his boss and uh, saying that, oh, we have to rewrite code, you know, and this boss is like, um, will there ever be a day where we don't need rewrites? And so you see Dilbert's answer. <laughs> okay, um, now I'm going to go through uh, uh, a couple of examples and increasing degree of complexity. So the first example is of how you would write a rule uh, to replace, for example, an import package name, right? For example, uh, for a long time, Twitter had its own um, non-fatal definition, and then uh, over the years, then Scala uh, the library kind of included its definition, and we wanted to switch over to the Scala library definition. And so we had to um, go through all our tons of Scala code in the uh, mono repo and rewrite it. And traditionally it's done manually and which is a very tedious and error prone task. And uh, with Scala fix, so all we had to do was kind of uh, come up with a rule. And uh, my colleague Shane, uh, who's in the audience, he pointed out that you don't even have to write a rule for this. You can issue that replacement statement in the scalafix command line itself. You can say scalafix replace and com.twitter.util.nonfatal with scala.util.control.nonfatal. Okay. So that's a trivial or simple example of how you would get started with a um, custom rule. So moving along, um, we had a um, developer who wanted to replace the use of future on success with a, a future dot respond, uh, apparently for performance reasons. And so he came up with a um, set of um, uh, rules for pattern matching on, uh, on success and then replacing it with uh, the return. Um, as you can see in this case, uh, it is not as trivial as in the previous case. It, there's a lot of uh, desugaring that's happening uh, in the Scala world. And there is also an opportunity, it's both a challenge as well as an opportunity for us to come up with some helpers perhaps, you know, um, uh, with the help of uh, developers who use this tool. So, Moving along to an even more complex example, uh, we evaluated moving um, a particular function which uses uh, what they call the fields-based API in Scalding. Um, I think most people here are familiar with the Scalding uh, library, at least heard of it. And, but they have multiple APIs, and so going from a fields-based API to a type-safe API, um, and it turned out to be a, a more involved and complex exercise, especially trying to use ScalaFix as it is today to do that kind of rewrite. So from this example on the left-hand side, you see um, with each line of text, 
you have uh, a flat map, um, a group by, followed by a write. Uh, in the fields API, um, based API case. And for most of them, there is a one-to-one -one mapping between flat map and group by. Now the size has to be a different uh, operation and then the right. Now, this is just tri sort of trivializing the whole problem because there are operations or operators on in the fields based API case, such as like rename and discard and pack and unpack, which have absolutely no equivalent on the type safe side. And also the type safe um, APIs require you to have some context around um, the code and which currently um, it's kind of not trivial to get from the context tree that the Scala fix is based on, right? The and the abstract syntax tree, we have to walk through it and we need a lot more helpers and a lot more complex. It's sort of a pipeline and you have to do like a phased rewrite. And that's what we kind of uh, ended up with in this case. <clears throat> okay, now, now I'll switch over to um, kind of a hands-on demo. <clears throat> So um, let's see if I can make this bigger. Is that, is that readable in the back? Um, okay. All right. So, um, so we invoke the first example is going to be about how we invoke ScalaFix using the PANS build tool. So it's integrated into it. So what what you provide is. Um, uh, a target, so PANS is based, the build is based on targets. You provide a target, then you provide some options, like whether it's a semantic rewrite or whether it's a syntactic rewrite, then you actually specify the rule. And in this case, we are using a custom rule, the on success caller that I mentioned before. And finally, I have to specify a PANS config file, which invokes the Scala meta or semantic DB uh, plug in during compilation. Um, the reason that is not part of your default PANS INI file is that there, there is some performance overhead in incorporating the plugins. And uh, some of that was kind of mentioned yesterday in the plugins talk um, where um, it doesn't come for free, so we haven't yet uh, integrated it into our mainstream uh, workflow. So uh, all that requires is specifying an extra uh, INI or a config file. Okay. So uh, when I type that command, so it, I cheated here a little bit in the sense that I'm using um, cached semantic DBs. Otherwise, I would be sitting here, you know, waiting for the compilation to finish. And um, so using the cache semantic DBs in, in my, um, uh, in my local like workspace, um, I, the Scala fix just finished, and uh, if I look at what my repo has, um, I didn't show you the status before, but you have to trust me, it was empty. I mean, there were no diffs, and so it rewrote a couple of files, and if I do a git diff, I can now see that um, I'm importing util.return, and the on success is now replaced by the respond, right, for those couple of files. So it's, it's really simple, but this is a very simple example. Um, and uh, what it lets me do is scale up. Uh, I mean, I, I specified a very simple and very narrow target, 
But if I want to apply this rule on the entire monorepo, then we would use another script, which we call distributed Scala fix. And um, the way we would, um, what, what it does is basically uh, farms out the job uh, to the, uh, what we call a cloud execu executive execution environment and uh, and in, invokes pan scala fix under the hood right so um, and um, so when we uh, invoke um, distributed scala fix as of I'm not going to do a real invocation here because you know clearly I don't want to fire off things to our um, cloud execution environment okay um, So I, it's just going to throw up the, you know, the help facility. Uh, and right now it is interactive, but we are trying to make it uh, an offline um, kind of facility where uh, a, use, a developer or user can fire off the job and you know, uh, go do something else. And then it'll come back and say, okay, you've finished rewriting the entire repo. Um, the, the third thing that I wanted to mention or talk about is this um, ScalaFX rules uh, directory, which uh, we are providing to enable developers or users to come up with their own um, custom rules. So uh, the template is very um, simple. You know, we, we saw examples of this before. It just says it extends, um, it can be a semantic rule or it can be just a syntax uh, rule. And then it would go ahead and you kind of code in your rule in the, uh, within it. Um, the other uh, advantage of doing it this here is you're able to run um, the uh, testing. You can test your custom rule with, before you go and apply it to the entire monorepo. Um, and uh, what that, uh, not that one, okay. That one. So it, it helps you to uh, uh, get familiar with the whole idea of writing your own rules and rewriting your code programmatically as opposed to you know, manually changing things. So um, that's, the end of my demo here. Uh, going back to the presentation. So to recap, uh, uh, ScalaFix uh, uses semantic DBs under the hood for semantic uh, rewrites, and we are providing, uh, we are doing semantic G DB generation automatically under the hood. It's not quite uh, like 100% integrated with the Twitter workflow, but still the infrastructure is ex exists and we are doing it frequently, like almost every day. And uh, we rely on a managed uh, CI infrastructure for, um, for doing distributed builds um, uh, for large scale uh, rewrites. And we are leveraging the PANS build cache. Um, and uh, so we have integrated with PANS, which is the build tool. And uh, we are hoping to, to do a lot more uh, with using this tool and looking forward to more and more uh, developers and users of this. So uh, none of this would have been possible without uh, some of my esteemed Twitter colleagues. I would like to give a shout out to Eugene Barmaco, who is uh, our tech lead, and then Shane, who's in, our, in the audience, who's put in a lot of uh, enhancement some of the scripts that we talked about today. And yeah, I go to him anytime I have questions and problems. And people in the Scala Center, um, as, and of course the OSS community. And uh, here are some of the references. Um, probably most of you are familiar with this already. Uh, 
Um, and so that's what we are thinking when Twitter code auto fixes itself. I don't get audio, so I don't know. <laughs> Is it working, not working? <laughs> It's not hooked up to the audio, I guess. <laughs> the audio is pretty awesome. So. <laughs> okay, uh, any questions on that? Ah, uh, yes. Real quick, how much control do we have on that code formatting? I know a lot of code generation tools, they generate compilable code, but it's pretty ugly from a formatting point of view. So there is something for Scala format, right? Uh, for Scala code. I mean, yeah, I'm assuming you're asking about Scala code. Um, uh, yeah, we've kind of experimented with that as well. Uh, it, is, uh, it is not completely a tough technical problem, right? Because when you're dealing with hundreds of developers, uh, we need to be uh, careful about what kind of policies we come up with, right? How you enforce it, or how do you deploy formatting you know, across a monorepo with millions of lines of code. So, so yeah, we are, uh, we have tried using Scala format. Uh, it works, and most of the issues uh, are, from my, from my understanding, they all surround whether people like a certain way of enforcing things or not, right? So policy-related issues. So basically just unleash Scala format afterwards. Yeah. And, uh, and there are ways to make it gentle on the user, too. I mean, we could incorporate it as part of our diffs, or fab, like we use Fabricator for our diffs. So, um, so it'll make it part of the review process, right? And people do like, some people, or most people like things happening automatically <coughs> under the hood, but some people don't like the result of that automatic change. So it's, it's a difficult problem to solve. Large scale. Um, any other? Yes. So the semantic rules seem pretty interesting. I guess I was wondering, what are some situations you found where you want to use syntactic rules? So I mean, it seems like Scala format covers probably a lot of the basic cases, like removing white space or kind of that sort of stuff. What are some other some syntactic rules you might choose to use? Uh, there are a whole bunch of rules. I, I'm not uh, Shane. Do you remember which one is the most Popular one that. I don't remember which one you had. Yeah, there were about. So I'm trying to bring up um, the rules uh, page. <clears throat> oh, great. D sugar? Okay. How about the, like dotty keywords and all that stuff? I think that's another rule that is syntactic. I don't think it needs semantic information. Yes. What? I can't? <laughs> okay. Dorothy, my police officer, says actually. Okay. Um, any other questions? Uh, let's say you had a rewrite rule that was, it was fairly common <coughs> to, to not fail on the all the places for the How long would that take to run over the entire uh, database? So we've made some improvements. It used to take a very long time. I mean, it, clearly it is, I would say, close to impossible to do it on your laptop, right? Um, so that's why we came up with the distributed mechanism where you, you know, have a Jenkins job or something like that. Um, so right now it is still in the you know evolution phases, and so um, I, I think recently Shane did a remove unused imports warnings all across the entire mono repo, and you know that was several hours of work, right? It takes several hours. It's not something that you can babysit. Wild rule of thumb, maybe double compile time. Yeah. It's not crazy, <coughs> but our code base size is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, so one thing 
in Haskell's, there's a bunch of kind of user supply rewrite rules that get run at compile time for um, like taking a bunch of folds and whatnot and compiling them into a really fast um, type loop. Um, would it be possible to take Scalafix and kind of, instead of um, fixing source code that you're going to be checking in, instead like run it as kind of like a preprocessor step to compile your code to a um, more efficient but semantically equivalent? Okay, so you're talking about like an optimization kind of phase that yeah. uh, that is opaque to the user, I mean, under the hood. Uh, yeah, potentially uh, we want to do it for performance reasons and whether we want to do it statically or whether we do it, I mean, we, we are running on a JVM. So. <laughs> So um, it, it is a potential usage of ScalaFix, uh, but more immediate to that is the linting part. I think we, we're seeing a lot of demand and requests for, hey, can, can you catch these patterns that, uh, I mean, if it's already in the code, that's fine, but I don't want people to develop new code with these patterns, so please you know, catch it and I don't have control over what my neighbor is coding. Right? So I want ScalaFix to do it. So, so those are the kinds of uh, uh, requests that we are getting. Okay. That's it?